Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise in support of this bill, C-43, Fast Removal of Foreign Criminals Act, today. I do not support the opposition's amendments and do not support the NDP and Liberals' attempt to try to prevent this important piece of legislation from becoming law. And I would like to thank the Minister for his courage and his conviction in ensuring that our immigration policies never put Canadians at risk. But don't just take it from me, Mr. Speaker, why this bill is necessary. Countless organizations and experts support Bill C-43, and I know Canadians will as well. And I'd like to take this opportunity to inform all members of this House of the important testimony we heard from Mr. Tom Stamatakis, President of the Canadian Police Association, in hopes that the NDP and Liberals will listen to the experts to our law enforcement officials to stop playing games with the safety and security of Canadians and support the Fast Removal of Foreign Criminals Act. I think Mr. Stamatakis summed up the Police Association's support for Bill C-43 when he stated, and I quote, Let me be absolutely clear. Canada as a nation is a stronger country because of immigrants who come here to enrich our communities through a shared culture. Police services across Canada, from Vancouver where I serve as a police constable, to Halifax and all points in between, count among our members a number of first and second generation immigrants who serve their adopted country with honour and pride every day and I'm one of them. He continues, unfortunately, there are those that come to Canada and choose not to respect and follow our laws. In fact, I was surprised to note in preparing for my appearance today that since 2007, according to the Department of Citizenship and Immigration, there have been an average of 900 appeals of deportation orders filed per year by serious criminals, over 4,000 in total. Surely, we can agree that our communities would be safer and our police would be helped by streamlining this process in removing these security concerns as quickly as possible. Under the current regime, criminals who are currently serving a sentence of less than two years are eligible to file an appeal to the Immigration Appeal Division. The CPA entirely supports the measures contained within this bill to reduce that time to sentences less than six months. We also support the new measures which would make it more difficult for criminals who have been sentenced outside of Canada to access the Immigration Appeal Division." End of quote. Mr. Speaker, these are not my words. These are the words of the President of the Police Association. We are talking about police officers who are in the streets every day, who put their lives on the line to protect and support us and have real-life experience, and they, Mr. Speaker, support Bill C-43. Mr. Stamatakis then proceeded to tell us of a story that cannot be repeated enough of the tragic death of Todd Bayliss. Mr. Tamakakis told the story of a way that bears repeating, and again, I quote him. On the night of June 16, 1994, Toronto Police Services Constables Todd Bayliss and Mike Leone were on foot patrol in a public housing complex on Trithuwe Drive in Toronto when they encountered Jamaican-born Clinton Gale. Gale was a 26-year veteran drug trafficker who had with him a fully loaded 9mm handgun and pockets filled with bags of crack cocaine. Clinton Gale struck Constable Bayliss and attempted to flee the scene. He was caught by two young Toronto officers, by the two young Toronto officers, and a gunfight erupted. Tragically, Constable Bayliss was shot in the head and killed in the line of duty after only four years of service, leaving behind family, friends, and colleagues who continue to honour his sacrifice. Unfortunately, this is one of the very real dangers that face our police personnel every day. What, I, what makes this case so particularly tragic, Mr. Speaker, and why I am here today before you is that this case was entirely preventable if only the provisions of Bill C-43 were in effect at that time. Clinton Gale had been under a deportation order because of the number of criminal convictions he had on his record for various serious issues such as drugs, weapons, and assault. Despite these convictions, Clinton Gale had used his time in prison to appeal his deportation order. And at the conclusion of his sentence in 1992, he was allowed to go free by an immigration department official after posting a meager $2,000 in bail. We now know that between 1990 and 1996, the government had made a number of efforts to deport Mr. Gale and that ultimately proved to be unsuccessful and that red tape and abuse of the system known by known criminals what led to the tragic murder of one of our colleagues, Constable Bayliss, as well as serious injuries to his partner, Constable Leone. End of quote. Mr. Speaker, Todd Bayliss's story deserves repeating because it, it is important that we remember the consequences of having a broken system of having a system that puts criminals ahead of victims and law-abiding Canadians, that allows endless appeals for dangerous foreign criminals so they can remain in Canada and use that time to commit more crimes and create more unfortunate victims. One of the most important parts of Mr. Stamakakis' testimony is that he debunked the ridiculous claim made 
constantly by the NDP and Liberals that criminals who have received a sentence of at least six months have not committed crimes that should be considered serious. For example, someone found growing six marijuana plants for the purpose of trafficking is not a serious criminal. This is what the President of the Police Association has to say, and I quote, I think that this, in this country, anybody who receives a custodial sentence of six months would have had to commit a serious crime. As a frontline officer, whether you're talking about a criminal act where innocent citizens in our country are being victimized by violence or other activities like that, or about white-collar crime where you have people who are losing life savings and having their entire lives destroyed, where there is a custodial sentence of a duration of six months, I think that somebody has committed a serious crime and I think that 800 is too many. Drug trafficking is drug trafficking. We've had police officers who've been either seriously injured or killed on duty or in a line of duty by people who aren't even involved in criminal activity at the time. Mr. Speaker, I could not agree more with the Canadian Police Association. What's especially telling, though, is that the NDP did not ask the representative from the Police Association a single question, not a single one. Here's a respected senior member of the police force whose organization represents over 50,000 frontline enforcement personnel from across Canada, serving in over 160 different police services, including police officers from federal, provincial, municipal, and First Nations police organizations, with probably more expertise on this bill and the issues surrounding it than any other stakeholder the committee heard, and the NDP did yet did not ask a single question. It shows yet again that, unfortunately, the NDP will not listen to Canadians, will not listen to the experts, and will continue to put the rights of criminals ahead of victims of law-abiding Canadians. And I urge, Mr. Speaker, the NDP and the Liberals today to listen to organizations like the Canadian Police Association and stop using amendments to try to prevent this bill from becoming law. And I implore the opposition to work with our Conservative government to ensure the speedy passage of this bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, questions and comments? Honourable Member for Winnipeg North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I want to cite the member for, for, for the example because his, his example is fundamentally flawed. Let me share with him uh, an email that, uh, that I had received and someone that had presented uh, before for the committee. And it uh, makes reference to his case. Um, makes reference to what the minister had said earlier in, uh, during a day on a CBC uh, morning interview, and that's what ultimately led uh, to this particular email that I received. And it is, and it states, and uh, a quote from it, um, referring to the minister, he specifically cites the cases of Clinton Gale, 1991 to 1994, and the two, uh, two BC street racers uh, that would be uh, Balara and uh, Kosa, and claimed that uh, these were both cases where the foreigners appealed deportation orders and committed further crimes in the interim. The minister is wrong. Gale did, did appeal the deportation order, yes, but lost. The Immigration Department then lost his file and then failed to get the travel document. Gale was not removed and he subs uh, subsequently killed Officer Bayless. The department, not the appeal division, was sued by the police force for their negligence, and the department settled the suit. The reason Gale remained in Canada was because of the department. It was not the appeal division. I wonder if the mem member might want to provide comment on that. The Honourable Member for Etobicoke Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and, and I thank the Honourable Member for his question, but you know, he stands up and says everybody's uh, seriously flawed when he asks a question. What's not seriously flawed is that Clinton Gale killed a police officer, and that is the bottom line, Mr. Speaker. And I can cite other cases. Jackie Tran, Tran from Vietnam, who had an assault with a weapon, drug trafficking, drug possession, failure to comply with court orders, sentences ranging from a $100 fine to two years less a day of imprisonment. Did he appeal? Absolutely. The removal order was given in April of 2004, and he was finally removed in March of 2010. Nearly six years of delay, Mr. Speaker, and while this guy was on the, on the streets committing further crimes against innocent Canadians. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Scarborough Rouge River. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, it's interesting to hear the, the, the very pointed angle that we heard from my uh, colleague, who's also a member of the Citizenship and Immigration Committee and knows that from witness after witness after expert after expert after lawyer after refugee uh, expert, we heard how this bill is not appropriate, that this bill is 
actually possibly unconstitutional, that this bill could, will, will be giving so much extra power in the hands of the minister, one person, rather than a tribunal, a board, and uh, what, what does my honourable colleague have to say about the fact that this bill will concentrate an excessive amount of power in the hands of one minister within this cabinet? <laughs> The Honourable Member for Etobicoke Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This bill is entirely appropriate. It's entirely appropriate because it safeguards honest, hard-working Canadians from foreign criminals who threaten their livelihood and, in fact, their lives at the end of the day. In fact, this, this member uh, is also on the Immigration Committee, Mr. Speaker, and had an opportunity to, to question the police witnesses, and yet no questions were given to, to those expert witnesses at that time. Mr. Speaker, this... this uh, this bill will do three things. It's going to make it easier, make it harder, and remove barriers. It's going to make it easier for the government to remove dangerous foreign criminals from our country. It's going to make it harder for those who may pose a risk to Canada to enter the country in the first place. And it's going to remove barriers, Mr. Speaker, for genuine visitors who want to come to Canada and take advantage of all that this country has to offer. Thank you. Uh,